So today's going to be kind of strange. What happened was I have all my notes because I taught this eight years ago. So I still have my notes. When I opened up the the document for today's notes, it only had the intro and the rest of it was not in the document. So I looked around. I couldn't find Plus, I couldn't get my hard drive to turn on. Oh. It finally turned on, my external hard drive. That's where I had it all. And, uh, and that's when I just saw it. 30 minutes ago, so I started typing. I thought maybe I was listening to my previous sermon, thought that maybe I can go through. So what I'll do is I'll talk through what I, everything I typed up, and then it's going to be kind of weird, but we'll listen to the other half from eight years ago, my sermon from eight years ago, see if we can listen to that. Oh, okay. So we'll see, how that, we'll see how that goes, yeah. Okay, well, let's get back into Matthew. <laughs> Okay, we left off in Matthew chapter 2. We talked about the Magi. We talked about Herod. But before we get into chapter 3, we'll finish up chapter 2 today. So chapter 2 starts off with an incredible journey, and it ends with an incredible journey. So let's uh, let's read that. Chapter 3, we're going to cover... I'm sorry, chapter 2, Matthew 2. And we will read... Verses 13 to the end of the chapter. There's a lot of theology in these. That's why I think I could have winged it if it was one of the other parts. But because this has a lot of theology, uh, that's why I wanted to listen to the to the audio because I need because there's a lot of notes um, in there that I don't I can't just remember off the top of my head. So it starts off with the incredible journey of the Magi who came from the east and. Um, how far was their journey? Well, we don't know exactly. We said it took them about two years, and so we don't know exactly the time or the distance, but it was a long distance and it was a long time. Um, we do know that they were led to Jerusalem by a mysterious star. We talk about that. We also know that this star appeared to them about two years prior to their arrival. Did they start traveling as soon as they saw the star? Well, we probably we don't know, um, but they were obedient. You know, later when we see when the angel talks to them, I mean, they were, they were obedient and they act, so they probably did. Once they saw the star, once they understood that, they probably took off on their so journey. When Jesus was born, that's when they were first told, and they probably started their journey then. And yes. So when they got there, uh, yeah, we talked about, like, the nativity scene, and, you know, we have these nativity scenes, and it has the right. baby, and it has, you know, the three wise men there. And cows well, and sheep. Yeah. But when they got there, he was already two years old, at least somewhere around there. So he wasn't still in the in the manger. manger. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just neat to have. You know, it's nothing wrong with having that. Okay, we know that the um, the mission that they were on, the mission was to find and then worship the King of the Jews. They said that they were following his star. We also know the Magi were successful with their mission. They found the child in Bethlehem, about five miles outside of Jerusalem. And they bowed and they worshipped him and they gave gifts to him, gifts fit for a king. And these gifts were probably um, what funded this trip to Egypt. Um, But one thing to consider is that we know that at least they gave these three gifts. They probably gave more. There was probably other things too. But it was these three things that Matthew wanted to, to bring out and to highlight. Because there was probably other things that, that, that they gave as, as well. We, we don't know. But at least we We're know these three things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're right. They'd have and to have a lot of supplies. Mm-hmm. And also, um, because of the caravan, you know that they weren't traveling just the three. Right. The yeah, they had an entourage. If they had this uh, entourage, then also the stopping and the, mm-hmm. you know, feeding the, their camels or whatever they were doing. Mm-hmm. And I've yep. just been kind of yeah. considering that. It's a big project. But you know what I was thinking? That Think about um, um, when they were first made aware that they needed to do this. I mean, that had to have been a huge event in the lives of these, you know, three wise men or whoever they were, um, just to make them commit to a two-year mm-hmm. trip 
Yeah. Actually, it was probably four years to, to, to get years back. Years, yeah, two years back. Yep. You know? at least. Yeah. So what a drama! There, you know. I mean, I wonder if any of the biblical history books tell anything about that. But yeah, no. I mean, we do have. There are um, stories, uh, like I said, they're they're legends about the three three kings, and they give them names. Um, they each they each have a name in in church tradition early early church tradition so um so yeah there's probably stories of, uh, about that you could probably find yeah but uh, about that. but yeah 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 they have yeah. all have names and they're all one's old one's young one's black you know so they have yeah there's a whole story behind each that? of them again it's it's just because there's another verse that talks about kings um coming to worship God, I forget which, it's, I think it's out of a psalm, and um, and the kings it mentions come from different countries, I think the countries are listed, and so they that's how they determine that one was probably from Ethiopia or, or, or something, and so they... Again, a mystery, how did they manage to meet up? Yeah, you know, yeah, were they also? each on their own, or they're on their own journey, and they yeah. met up together somewhere, huh. so... Just think when we get to heaven, we'll be able to find the answer. Yeah. If if you if you uh, have access to the movie, is the TV show. Remember, it came out in the seventies. It was called uh, Jesus of Nazareth, mm-hmm. and that they took a lot of time doing a lot of research on on that, and they consulted like Jewish people, they consulted Protestants <laughs> and Catholics, and they consulted a lot of a lot of people in creating in creating the movie. What of yeah. Nazareth? Jesus of Nazareth. It was a, it was a mini series. Yeah, really yeah. Title. yeah, and that has a you know it shows the three kings and their interaction and, and whatnot. So James Earl Jones. Actually, kings. I don't know. It doesn't say. I mean, I, I think I think it, I lean more towards um, them being soothsayers or magicians or yeah. astrologers or whatever. That's what I understand. That, yeah, yeah, they were reading the stars. So, but they obviously were wealthy to bring the gifts that they had. So, when they completed their mission, their journey was over. They returned back to to their home, and like I think we talked about this a bit last week too. Was like, did, did, were they believers at this point, or did they understand what that meant? I mean, they came and worshipped. They, they identified him as the King of the Jews. I think so. <clears throat> the journey as there will be as they answer the call of God. I think that moment mm-hmm. they became believers. Mm-hmm. So that's what changes us. Right. That, that, uh, the answer to the call. And at this point, <coughs> Gentiles weren't being brought into Israel, so they go back to their their own country. I wonder country, how yeah. long they stayed in Bethlehem too. I mean, they didn't probably just spend the night and head back. You know? Yeah, they they uh, they packed up pretty quickly, and and in fact, we'll read that verse here in a minute. The last uh, verse twelve. But so but let's we're about to get into the next second incredible journey. The first was the Magi's journey. Now the second journey of them going into uh, Egypt. And this next the what we read um, thirteen verse thirteen through twenty three. It has three parts to it, and each of the parts ends with a fulfillment of scripture. In case you didn't you didn't notice that verses thirteen through fifteen is the first part when they leave the, the uh, Egypt or when they leave to Egypt. Uh, verses 16 through 18 is when Herod kills ch- the children, and verses 19 through 23 is when Herod Herod dies. Okay, so those are the three sections we're gonna we're gonna cover here. Now, there were parallels to the Exodus um, in what we what we read. There were these parallels. Um, I'll just list off some of them. Both have a slaughter of male children. We talked about this um, a few weeks ago. During the time of Moses, the Pharaoh said, kill all the male children. Well, Moses' mother didn't want to do that, so she put him in a basket, sent him down the river, and then that's how he ends up being in Pharaoh's home. Pharaoh's daughter finds him and then raises him. So Moses is saved. Now this time, they're going to kill the children. Joseph, an angel, tells Joseph and warns him, so he leaves and he flees. And... um then Jesus Jesus is saved. And also in uh, the Exodus story, Moses flees Egypt to find safety. He has to leave because he killed uh, an Egyptian soldier, and so now Pharaoh wants to kill him. 
So he leaves because so he doesn't get killed. Now in this story, Joseph flees Israel to find safety because they're going to kill Jesus. So he has to he has to flee. Um, in the story of the Exodus, Moses and e- Israel they leave Egypt during the at, at the Passover, and when they leave, they leave at night. It was at midnight that they that they left, and so the children of Israel they flee Egypt at night, and now we see Joseph and his family they flee. Israel at night. The angel comes to them in the middle of the night and tells them, and they get up and, and they go. And then Moses returns to Egypt after the Pharaoh dies. Okay, after being 40 years in the wilderness in, in Midian, and he finds a wife and he has children, he has a whole life out there. Um, after the Pharaoh dies, God tells him in Exodus 4 and verse 19 Now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. And now we see Joseph returns to Israel after Herod dies. The angel comes and tells him, in verse 20 we read, For those who sought the child's life are dead. Okay, so we see these parallels and we see these same kind of motifs in these stories. And the interesting thing is, um, remember we mentioned how in the first century, Greek was now kind of the, the common language. Um, a lot of the Jewish people didn't didn't know Hebrew, and they and they probably didn't read Hebrew, but they knew Greek, and so the the Jewish Bible, the the Old Test the whole Old Testament has been translated into uh, Greek, and that translation is called the Septuagint, and that was created back in 300 BCE, uh, before the Common Era or BC. So during the time of Jesus in the first century, the the Bible that everyone used was the Apocrypha or, or the the Septuagint. It was a, the Greek translation. And so, if we were to go back and look at the Greek of Matthew, and some of these quotes that he mentioned, some of these parallels that I that I just mentioned, and look at the 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 Greek Septuagint, um, you'll see that it's a lot of the same words. So he's quoting the story of the Exodus, and bringing it into this story here because he's making the connection for the people. He's helping them to understand that that it, it's it's related. So the stories in the Old Testament are talking about, about Jesus. Um, he's kind of like he's telling them, you know this story. You know, you've heard this before. And, he, and he's, he's bringing, bringing this to them. And he's reminding them of the story of the Exodus. Because the Passover is a paradigm for redemption. The Passover is a story of redemption, of God redeeming his people, bringing them out of Egypt, and bringing them in for himself. And so, and so uh, Matthew was making that connection for them. Because in the life of the Jewish people, Passover is the highlight of the year. Passover is is the main festival that 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 happens, and it kicks off all the other festivals. And so he's bringing that connection of of Jesus in in the Passover. And if you remember, in the, um, at the end of Luke, um, I think it's 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 just in Luke where when after Jesus is, has resurrected, and now he appears to the disciples, and it said he opens their minds to the scriptures. He opens their minds so they can understand the scriptures. And also on, on the road to Emmaus with the two disciples, it said he he told them, starting in Genesis and through the rest of the Bible, the, the, Old, the Old Testament, he showed himself in the scriptures. He showed them where he was at in the scriptures. And so they were able to see that and say, wow, he was the Messiah. He is the Messiah. Because remember, they were doubting. They were like, we thought he was the Messiah. You know, the two guys on the road to Emmaus. And he says, oh, no, let me show you. He, I am the Messiah. And so now that's what I think that Matthew is doing here. Matthew is now, I mean, we've only covered two chapters. And Matthew is pulling out so much of the Old Testament and bringing it to them and just showing them Jesus is in the Old Testament. He is the Messiah. And it's just, it's, it's mind-blowing, the, 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 all the connections that we have here. Okay, so. Yeah, yep. It's the hand of God. So in verse 12, in uh, chapter 2, 
It says, And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. So they knew Herod was going to be out for them. The angel warned them, and so they, they went back home, but they went a different way. They went uh, a different route. So again, we see their obedience and, and their act of faith uh, by obeying the angel. They just get up and leave. No questions asked. They just get up and they go. Now verse 13. When they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord. Remember when the Magi showed up? Behold, Magi. So now it's behold, but this is a good messenger, an angel. The angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. So what's the deal with uh, Joseph's in the Bible having dreams and God speaking to them in, in dreams, just like uh, the Joseph in the Old Testament, how he trans he um, not not only did he uh, explain the dreams of Pharaoh, but God spoke to him in dreams. Right, so we we call him the King of Dreams, Joseph, the King of Dreams, because he not only did he have dreams, he was able to interpret them and what they meant. And so now we see this Joseph having dreams as well. Get up and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Verse 14, so Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. So he didn't ask any questions. It was still night, got up, had the dream, woke up, let's go, packed everyone up. And again, this is, demonstrates Joseph's obedience as well. This is why God chose him, I, I believe, because God knew that he was, this was a man of faith. This was a man that was, that was obedient and he acted on faith. That's why he chose Miriam to be the mother of Jesus. That's why he chose Joseph to be the father, to take care of him, because he needed people who were going to be who were going to trust him. And so the path of obedience is a path of faith. So he's obedient because he believes. And like the magi, magi he just gets up and he leaves, no questions asked. In scripture, Egypt is not a desirable place. And so he didn't say, "Wait a minute, Egypt," because we know about the story about Abraham and how Abraham. There was a famine, so he goes down to Egypt, and that didn't turn out too well for him. Um, I think he did that twice, didn't he, Abraham? And then uh, we see his son Isaac doing that as well. But uh, thankfully, I don't think Jacob went down there. Jacob went and stayed with what, who, Abimelech or something like that. But um, but we see when things get really bad, um, or at least things were so bad in Israel that they went to Egypt to find uh, to find refuge, and so that's kind of. Um, it's kind of interesting to go into a place that is symbolic of, of bad to go and find um, a place of refuge. Verse 15. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. So this is the end of that first section and we get to the first prophecy. And this is in Hosea 11 verse 1. When Israel was a youth I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. This is this is the scripture that is referencing. Hosea 11 and verse 1. So what does this mean? Well, the context in Hosea um, is Hosea the prophet telling the people of, e of Israel about the Exodus. He's reminding Israel out of Exodus. Why? Because the Exodus, again, the Exodus is that story that's, that's repeated throughout the whole Bible. Because... Yeah, it's it's the, 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 the Passover and that whole event is is the the key event throughout the whole Bible because it's a picture uh, it's a type and shadow of what Jesus is gonna do. God went into Egypt, he pulled them out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, saved them through signs and wonders. He went into Egypt and brought them out to be his people. Jesus comes and he dies as the Lamb of God. He comes into this world full of sin to pull us out to be with him. And so that is the, that is the picture. Um, and if we understand that, we'll understand the mission of Jesus and everything that, 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 that he did. So the context of, the, of this passage in Hosea is the prophet reminding Israel of the Exodus. Uh, the Exodus is God demonstrating his love for them. God did all the work. Israel didn't have to do anything. They just sat there in Goshen while God was doing all the signs and wonders in Egypt. Well, the same, the same is with our uh, uh, faith in, in Jesus. 
doesn't matter the works that we do. We could be a good person and give to the poor and help help everyone and be polite and not say any cuss words and, and just be the nicest person ever. But that's not going to get us into heaven. It's only through the work of Jesus that we're going to get into heaven. And so that's that's the picture. There was nothing that they could do. There's nothing that we can do. So he brings up this picture of of again Passover because again he's he's making these connections, these parallels, and then he gets to this he gets to this scripture out of Egypt. I I, uh, I called my son. Um, another another good thing before we move on. Another good thing about the Exodus, if we think about what God did in creation. And the way that the Bible describes creation, what does it say? God spoke and it came into being. He just spoke. He just spoke with a word and it happened. But with the Exodus, the description that the Bible has is with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. So it's like it was like more work. It was more you know, compared to a word it was like more work for him to do. Not he that, could just say it. Yeah. He could have just said Yeah, yeah, he could have. He could have. Yeah. It, but but it, I think it's just demonstrative of, you know, of, of him doing the work for, for us. And that's, in the, you know, again, because the Bible is going to use these descriptions for us to understand and to relate to. And why is it more work? Because we're stubborn. Why? Yeah. <laughs> and again, if it's a picture of what Jesus did... He went through a lot, all the all the beatings and and the mocking, the shame, um, everything that he went through uh, was that was a lot, more than we can handle. So it says, "My son, uh, Egypt, I, out of Egypt, I called my son." In the scriptures, a lot of times, um, well, at least in the Old Testament, when when it says, "My son." A lot of times it's talking about Israel. It's a reference to Israel because that's that's Israel is also known as God's for, firstborn, right? The, the the people of Israel. But also, my son, he's talking about Jesus. But Jesus is actually a picture of of Israel. Um, when the high priest on Yom Kippur, when the high priest would go and make the sacrifice, he would wear the it was the the breast the breastplate. And it had a stone that represented each of the twelve tribes, and then their names was, were etched on them. And even on his shoulders, it had six tribes here and six tribes here on his shoulders. So that when the priest came in, one man he comes in representing all of Israel, and he does the sacrifices and everything he does is for all the people of Israel. That's what that represents. He he comes in as the the you know the Israelites representing all of the other is all of Israel, and so he's a picture of Jesus. Because that's what Jesus is. He's like, he is the 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 main uh, Israelite, and so so when when he is called the son, it's like he's representing all of all of Israel. Um, okay. Any questions on that first section so far? There's a lot. I know it's a lot of information, and we could probably spend more time on that passage in Hosea. <laughs> And there's probably other passages that relate to that as well. I think in Numbers too, there's another passage that talks about bringing them out of out of Israel. So now I will switch to pre-recorded pre-recorded um, teaching here. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. So Herod, like Pharaoh, has a short temper. He gets very enraged. He's angry. His reaction and emotions are exactly the opposite of the reaction and emotions of the Magi. The Magi are filled with joy, and they're happy to see this uh, this child king. And... uh what do we see? Herod, he wants him dead, so he's angry. Actually, Herod's later years were, were marked with all kinds of massacres and, and deaths. I mentioned to you before that he killed uh, two of his sons. He even killed uh, his own wife. And even um, he ordered that upon his death, a member of every prominent Jewish family under his rule 
should be executed in order that, in order that there would be sufficient mourning for his passing. Isn't that nice? Because he knew he was hated. No one liked him. He knew everyone hated him. <clears throat> and they would have been rejoicing at his death. So in order for the place for everyone to be mourning, they gathered, he gathered um, one, one man from every prominent family and held them in uh, one of the stadiums there. And then upon his death, he had each, all of them died, all of them killed, murdered, just so that there would be uh, mourning. He's a sick and twisted guy. And even he killed one of his sons right, uh, right as he was dying as well because he was going to take his throne. He's going to die. I mean, come on. <clears throat> now, an interesting thing is the population of Bethlehem around this time, they calculate, was about 1,000 people. It wasn't a very big uh, metropolis. You know, some of the early Christian commentators, they, they exaggerate the number of, uh, of people that lived there um, to match various prophecies. Um, but, you know, some try to say that there was hundreds of thousands of people that lived in Bethlehem. No, it's probably about 1,000 people that, that lived there. And because of the, the birth rate and the mortality rate um, at that time in the first century, it, it was probably only about 20 children that were killed which, you know, I say only, you know, it was, it was still hor- horrific. Because you can imagine if these were all families that knew each other and these children were killed, it was, it was a, still a very horrific act. But it kind of puts things into perspective compared to what, you know, you see in the movies and, you know, in the, in the shows. Um, <clears throat> let's continue, verse 17. What then had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. Okay, so this is another fulfillment of Scripture. What is this passage? This is a quote of Jeremiah 31, verse 15. Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they were no more. So what's the context of the passage in in Jeremiah? What is it talking about here? When Nebuchadnezzar was uh, taking captives, uh, the captives of Judah and Benjamin, um, they were gathered, kind of a staging area was was Ramah, where they were gathering all all the people before he he took them in. Ramah is is there in that that region of, uh, of Bethlehem. So this was the staging area, and so when they would march them out, they marched by um, Bethlehem because I think it was Ephrata was part of this vicinity as well, uh, this other location. And this is where Rachel's tomb was. And so when they marched everyone into Babylon, they're marching by her tomb. And so therefore, Rachel is seeing her children being taken off into exile. Who is Rachel? Well, she's one of Jacob's uh, uh, wives. Even though most of the tribes were born through Leah, um, you know, we, at least we know uh, Benjamin was was one of her uh, one of her children, but still they consider her a patriarch or uh, a matriarch, and so she would she would consider all of them her her children, and so this is where they get this idea that Rachel would be in a sense crying that her children are going into into Babylon. But in our passage, the crying is for the children who were killed and not the one who was leaving and going into Egypt, right? We should, they were probably rejoicing that Yeshua escaped and uh, made it to, to Egypt. And so she's crying for all these children, these, these 20 plus children that were killed there in Bethlehem. So how is this a prophecy to, you know, I know not all prophecies are, uh, are positive prophecies, but uh, how can, what, what can we put together here um, and think about in a positive way, uh, what's being said here. Consider Jeremiah 31. Are you familiar with, with the chapter of Jeremiah 31? You know, that's, that's the passage that says, Jeremiah 31 and verse 31, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers. Does that sound familiar, that, that chapter? That's a chapter of hope. Go back and read that. Read Jeremiah 31. It's, it's, it's a whole, it's a chapter of hope. Um, although the people are going to be exiled into Babylon, it's not the end. 
God's going to bring them back. That's the message of Jeremiah. It's not just, you know, the doom, but it's hope. He's saying, yes, these things are going to happen, but God's going to bring you back. And so he's given a, a, a message of hope. And we see Jeremiah, um, one, one commentary I was looking at, and they, they pulled out a lot of different scriptures that are with Jeremiah 31 that, that parallel with the entire gospel of, of Matthew. Because he understood this, he understood what Messiah was doing, what Messiah came to do, and so he's pulling in these ideas and these and these thoughts from this particular chapter in Jeremiah into the whole gospel. So now in Bethlehem, we can look at the positive side of this. Although these children have died, it's not the end. Yeah, they suffered, and they you know it was this horrible anguish that these children and these families have gone through, but. Take heart, because the Messiah is now in Egypt, and he's going to come back. There's hope. There's hope in the Messiah. This 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 happened, but it's it's have hope that Messiah is going to return. And so we can see that there is hope in Yeshua. There's hope in Messiah, um, in this. Okay, let's wrap up with the last part. Verse nineteen. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in. in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a place called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, this Ar- Archelaus, his son, there was, there was two sons, Antipas and Ar- Archelaus. And they were both vile men, but this guy was worse than, than, uh, than the other. And so this is why you see you know, him saying he was afraid to go there. And the region that he, that he went to in Galilee was run by one of Herod's other sons, Philip. And Philip wasn't nearly as bad as these other guys. And so this is why, again, you see them trying to evade the rule of Herod because of who he is and what he stood for and the things that he would do. So this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. He went to Nazareth. Nazareth is situated in the lower Galilee, just north of the valley of Jezreel, approximately 64 miles north of Jerusalem. I didn't realize it was that far, 64 miles north of Jerusalem. And you know how we talk about how uh, Yeshua, this was his stomping grounds. This is where he was, Capernaum, and in, in, in this area. Um, and to get to Jerusalem, he, you know, obviously he's walking. So it's about a three days journey from Galilee down to Jerusalem, 64 miles. Can you imagine that? Hey, feast day's coming up. Let's start walking. Let's walk to Colorado Springs, or what? You know, what's what's sixty four miles away? What could, what can be a good idea for us to you know start the hike? And actually, Capernaum was uh, twenty miles south southwest, uh, or um, yeah, it was twenty miles southwest of Capernaum. The population of Nazareth in the uh, first century is estimated at about uh, four hundred and eighty people on a sixty acre land area. So it wasn't a very big place. Nazareth was a, a city of low esteem to some. I remember uh, Nathaniel, what does he say? Can anything good come out of uh, Nazareth? So it wasn't a very play, a good place. It wasn't a place of notoriety. But this is what we see God doing all the time. He's always from the lowly, from the small. Even, even Israel, why did he choose them? They were the smallest, you know. And then the, the smallest in, in Judah, uh, Bethlehem, that's where he's going to that's where he's going to be born. So out of the lowly, out of the small, out of the, the meek, out of the, the, you know, the, the undesirables is where God brings those that he's going to use, not those that are high and lofty. Let's look at this prophecy. Notice it says, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. Where the, all the other ones, it says, through the prophet. And then, you know, most of us, our Bibles, it has a, a mark that we know exactly which, which passage. This isn't a, this isn't a, uh, uh, a, 
As a matter of fact, I wonder what mine says. But this isn't a reference to any particular scripture. What, look at your Bible. What does your Bible say? Does it uh, cross-reference it to something? To another passage in Matthew? But not to a, but not to a, uh, not to a prophet? Judges 13.5? B, number three, B, Mark, John, well, that's just Nazareth. Yeah, yeah, mine doesn't really, it doesn't have anything. What, what, what does your say, Art? What, uh, what translation do you have? Judges 13. For behold, you shall conceive a son and give birth to a son. The razor come of him. He, oh, that's good. Okay, that's, that's, we're going to talk about that. Good. What uh, publisher is that? Who published that? Uh, okay, I want to look at that. Hopefully we can before you leave. Um, okay, here's the thing. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say what it. Oh man, I'm sorry. I'm going I'm way over. It's a play on words. Um, the more I'm learning about the Hebrew culture, the more these things are making sense. And uh, I just wish I could convey as, as much as I could to help you um, just grasp more of, of the Hebraic mind and, and the Hebraic literature and, and just the way they, they do things. Uh, but it's a play on words. Matthew is connecting Natsir to uh, Natsri. Natsri is the Nazarene. Uh, Natsir is Nazarite. Okay, he's making the connection through it through the the similar sounds. You know, I I, I do something similar to this with my kids. I'll say I'll I'll say a phrase or I'll say something, and then I'll kind of walk off to see if they hear actually heard what I said. Usually after I'm upstairs, and finally I hear Dad. You know, because I I just want I want to get them to think about what I just said. I want. I want them to, you know, to think about words and I'm trying to help expand their vocabulary. And so I'll play games like that. I can't even think of any examples right now, at least none that might that won't embarrass them. But I just say, you know, just just I just try to use fun words and, you know, even cross, you know, words, words that have different meanings, you know, English things, but this is Hebrew. Um so it's it's a play on words, and that's what Matthew's trying to do here. Um the Nazarite is it's it's a concept and uh, it became kind of a concept it wasn't just a person but it was it was a, a a concept of a of a holy person what are what is a nazarite a nazarite was someone who was separated to god by a specific oath right the high priest he was born into that role and then he had to separate himself to be unto god but the nazarite was not a son of aaron or maybe he was a son of aaron and he still wanted to do it because i think it wasn't samuel but anyway um, if they wanted to be like um, a high priest, they could sanctify themselves. And much of what they did was like the high priest where they couldn't touch wine and various things. Um, so the Nazarite was, was made holy unto God. The Nazarite was made holy unto God. Now this passage here, um, that was uh, 13 and 5. For behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the boy shall be a Nazarite, a Nazir, to God from the womb. That's the Masoretic text translation. If you were to read the Septuagint translation in the Greek, it wouldn't. It doesn't say Nazarite. You know what it says? It says he will be a holy one, a holy one to God. It doesn't say Nazarite. It says he will be, he shall be a holy one to God. 
See, because if you were to say that in, in, this, in this time, oh yeah, he's a holy one. Oh, you would know, okay, he's a Nazarite. Because it was kind of like synonymous. It was, it was this concept of, of someone being holy, they were a Nazarite. And so Matthew is, is making that connection because we know that Yeshua is called the Holy One. He is the Holy One of God. And I think he calls him the Holy One. Of Matthew calls him the Holy One of God. And so he's making that connection, that play on words with Nazarite and Nazir. I mean, his life, his whole life was separated to God. He was the quintessential Nazarite. He, he was, if anyone ever wanted to be the perfect Nazarite, I mean, look at how Yeshua lived. If you want to be a Nazarite, how did Yeshua live? Now, he didn't live, you know, always away from wine and, and the dead and those things. But, uh, but if anyone had a life separated unto God, it was Yeshua. He was the ultimate Nazarite. He was the Holy One, the Holy One of God in every way, in every way. That's, well, that's, that's a great, uh, that's great, Art, that made that, made that connection for me. That's awesome. So Yeshua would be, would be known as Yeshua HaNatsir, the Nazarene, um, which was close enough to being Yeshua. Uh, I'm sorry, he would be called Yeshua HaNatsri. That's what they would call him, Yeshua HaNatsri, Yeshua the, Naz- the Nazarene. But that's a, that's a close, en- it sounded close enough for Matthew to make this application that he would be called Yeshua HaNatsir, the Nazarite, the Holy One. So that... Uh that covers it again. Yeah, again, I knew I knew I couldn't remember all of those facts because you know, back then I was studying all week, and so I had all that information fresh good. in my mind. And uh, yeah. so, but yeah, I, I just didn't want to blow through that because each of those sections had it's a lot of good information. And again, Matthew was given all of this stuff for a reason. He's trying to make some connections, and he's trying to help his audience understand that Jesus is he is the Jewish Messiah he is the king who who has come and he's just really trying to to uh, to solidify that in their in their minds so any other thoughts or any other comments or questions well, when they picked up in the middle of the night to flee to Egypt they must have had a U-Haul standing by or something I mean, they must have traveled pretty light to, be able to <clears throat> yeah. pick up and, mm-hmm. you know. Yep, and they had all that that money, is, or at least they had the valuable gifts. Is what we're studying and how in-depth you've gotten into the Bible and stuff, I mean, you're already saved. I, I think probably it's fair to say your faith is unshakable or your salvation. So, <coughs> in the world today, all these great people running around, you don't know the Lord. If getting to heaven is just accepting Christ, I mean, this is going so deep, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. It's like, is it to enhance our own faith? Wh- what is exactly it, this? Is for people that are struggling to, that need faith? I don't need any more faith, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. Going deep like that? Is it just for your own personal Yeah, faith? well, yeah. Just stay connected to the Lord. Yes, yeah, it's, it's for us to, I think it's, because we haven't arrived. I mean, we're learning stuff here that has nothing to do with my salvation. Right. Is it, I'm trying to get to the point that for me to be a wholesale understand. Yes. It, yeah. That's what I think. I think it's it's for us to to really see, um, like my boss, he says the 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 fingerprints of God in the Word. Um, because when we see all these connections, we see that. Jesus wasn't lying. He is in the Old Testament, and this is how. Matthew's showing us how. And how all these things are being fulfilled, all these things are connected. I think it really just solidifies that. But yes, I think what, what you're talking about is like the person who's down and out. They need help. They need love. They need security. And so they they need someone now. And so that's when God can call them. He calls them to himself and, um, and changes their heart to accept him and gives them that that gift of salvation that gift of repentance and then once they come in once you become a believer 
Our job is now to learn about God. The Bible is the revelation that God has given us of himself. And so when we dig into it like this, this is when God is revealing himself to us. And, and, and so it strengthens that relationship. It solidifies our understanding of him. And it just continues to, you know, to, to, to build. Well, plus the human mind is automatically curious and wanting to mm-hmm. want more, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I like the backstory and, yeah. and the minutiae. Yeah. Even some of these, you know, basically history books. Like, mm-hmm. uh, what's the name that you have of mine? Enoch. Enoch. Uh-huh. What? Enoch. Enoch. Yeah, I couldn't think of that. And I saw that there's one, I saw online that there's one Adam and Eve. Uh, which, you know, I don't know anything about. Mm-hmm. But I mean, for us, so God, God is God let's put this map for the, for the inquiring mind that want to know. And it's just for our it's for our own edification and to, to be close to him and but it has nothing to do with saving people out there. What we're studying right now. I'm trying to correlate what right. fits in. So we go and we we go and we minister to someone, have coffee with them on a regular basis, you know, maybe they're going through hard times, we meet with them and pray with them. And then once we know that they've come into a saving faith, that they've become a believer, that's when we bring them in and we say, Now come and learn the word. Now come and learn, um, you know, get the meat of the scripture and not just the the milk where it's just, you know, happy, feel-good scriptures. Now we need to dig in and just, you know, again, just see what, what is the word saying to us. Because right now, Matthew is building up until we get to chapter 5. Chapter 5 is when Yeshua is going to start... This is what I'm saying. Blessed is this person. Blessed is that person. Do this. Don't do that. And he's about to get into some scriptures. And so you need to get the backstory to know that, okay, he is the Messiah. So when he talks, now we got to listen. 